Hey everyone, and welcome to open class number nine. How are you, Mike? Hey everybody, doing doing fine, doing fine. Uh, yeah, as maybe some people don't know, a lot of fires out here in the West, and uh, we don't live too far from each other. And yeah, it's been it's been an interesting last week. It really has. So we're we're safe down here. Just lots of smoke in the air, but we're okay. And hopefully, you're okay up there. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that uh, to, to everyone actually on the channel here that the reason I've not been uploading much videos in this week is that there's been this fire and, and uh, you know, constantly being anxious about being <laughs> evacuated. It's been quite nerve wracking. But uh, yeah, yeah, so far so good. Uh, there's rain predicted for Tuesday, so hopefully that will uh, really help. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so with that said, yeah. um, we have some questions and uh, yeah, let's just jump into it. And we have three questions and uh, um, I think a lot of, will bring you a lot, a lot of value to, to look at these. The first one actually is, this is a, a, a comment on the latest video. Ask, uh, uh, it's, it's the uh, open class number eight from Panther Sprung um, who says, hey, do you have any take on insomnia also serving as a self-distraction method? Since a health scare uh, about a month ago, I suffer from sleeping problems and a range of strong anxieties, and they seem to adhere to similar mechanism. The more I think about my, that I might have a panic attack, the likelier it will happen. The more I listen for my newfound tinnitus, the more prominent it gets, etc. And what I learned from your channel about insomnia, obsessing over insomnia tends to make it worse. When one of my fears gets debunked, for example, health scare or being told that my heart was fine after being rushed to the hospital due to panic, it doesn't take long for the next fear or thing to come along. Since I should be studying for a job and a future I'm skeptical about when not obsessing over my health, I've come to think that these fears could maybe serve as a subconscious need of mine to keep myself from the burden I feel that's attached to studying the future, especially since I know I shouldn't feed these fears, but do so nonetheless, almost as if I was sabotaging myself. I have an appointment with my psychologist tomorrow to see where to go from here. An appointment I, of course, am dreading because of the fear of not being able to sleep again and then fainting on my way there, but would be very interested in your view of these things, uh, my serving a personal functions. Thanks a lot for the information. Uh, uh, this actually, this visit actually went well, but I think there was really interesting, a lot to talk about. So I think that the way I understand it, the, like the, uh, I think we can go back and talk about many things, but the core question here becomes something like, uh, do you think that my insomnia in a way serves a purpose that my brain is kind of using it in a way, in this particular example, almost like an excuse, like I don't want to study for this job. So my brain creates this kind of problem with sleeping to keep it busy with that instead, something of that nature. Well, what do you think, Michael? Yeah, um, it sounds like I think what they referred to as avoidance behavior a little bit, where um, you're using it to, you know, give you a reason for not progressing in, in your studying and, and working towards your future. Um, I don't think it's that unusual, to be honest. I think it happens a lot. I think it's it, a lot of it is kind of people don't aren't even really aware that they're doing it. So um, first thing is you seem to be kind of aware of it. So that's a good first step that, um, you know, you might recognize there's other things kind of playing into it. Um, also, you know, maybe you might be a person kind of prone to becoming anxious about different things at different times. That's sort of that predisposition, the first P of the three P's that we talk about. Um, not to say that you can't work through that, you know, the, the first, the predisposition doesn't mean you can't sleep you know that's i like to remind people of that it's like well i'm predisposed so therefore i can't sleep no that's not true it just means you might have to kind of you know i like to, i say work on it but you know what i mean by work on it it's it's you know work on not working on it that's really what i mean so um you know i think you're you, you know you're, you're it looks good for you um uh you were sleeping well i'm pretty sure and then um so you know that's great verification right there that um you know things can get better and um, they probably will. I'm pretty, I hear a lot of optimism uh, in that email that you sent. Yeah, that, that was, I think that was my spontaneous reaction too, that we all kind of pro procrastinate, you know, we have very various different ways of doing that. When there's something we're not really interested about, we kind of 
subconsciously or consciously find ways not to do that and focusing on your sleep and kind of like problem solving that sure that could happen and by the way melina says hi here hi melina hi melina <laughs> Now, another thing I was thinking about was um, how, it, it, I think this is a very important and interesting one, which is how um, Panther Sprung said that, uh, I, I think it's he, I don't know, but I'll just say he said um, that he, uh, as soon, uh, he had this like, he was worried about something, and as soon as he stopped worrying about that, he found something else to worry about, which I think is just, uh, so it's, it's important to talk about how when, when your brain is in this like hyper aroused kind of nervous state and it's in this like it's looking out for potential problems then when one problem stops it's like another one comes along and I think again awareness is very important because if you start seeing this pattern that I was really worried about my palpitations but they told me there was nothing wrong with that and so now I'm worrying about my uh, you know these uh, I don't know uh, leg movements I have or twitches but then I was told nothing was wrong with that. Coach Michael disappeared, but I'm sure he'll be back in a second. Oh, there he is. <laughs> the internet has been really s slow and sketchy around here. So sorry about that. I think it's, I just made a quick adjustment. I think we're good. Okay, I, I hope it'll work well. Um, yeah. So I was just saying, I, I think if, if anyone out there sees this pattern that, okay, I was worried about this and then I got reassurance. Now I'm worrying about that and then I reassure. Then that awareness can in itself be very reassuring because you, you realize that, okay, my, my brain is just this in, in this kind of, problem solving mode and just knowing that can make you reassured next time you think about something then you almost automatically say oh i probably shouldn't be worried about that so i think that was an important one and i felt there was more let's go over this one more time uh, any thoughts to michael in the meantime no i i, I think uh yeah i i You're pretty covered what you say. I think, yeah uh, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I think I remember what it was. Firstly, this started with a health scare, which is, I just want to say this is super common. One of the most common reasons I see, see people have problems, like it starts with a health scare, common one. But then this one is very interesting. Um, uh, one that when you're looking out for certain things, and I see this, a lot of people who are scared that they have SFI, uh, which is super rare. And, uh, and, ha and you know, when, when people re read about the symptoms, then they start having them. I think that's very common to know that if you, anybody tunes in hearing this, if, if you start doing that, if you read about something and then you experience it, that is not unusual at all. And the way I think about it is that the brain is like a safety machine. So it always wants to keep you safe from various threats. And when you read about, oh, this could be a threat, then weirdly the, the mind makes you, makes kind of produces those symptoms so that it, in an attempt to kind of try to keep you safe from that. And so I think awareness of that is very good. Because when you read about something and you have those symptoms, well, then, you know, you probably know why. And then finally, I just want to say here, the tinnitus. This has been something that's been really interesting since I started, you know, this YouTube channel is to find that there seems to be a really strong relationship between tinnitus and anxiety. I don't know if you, have you ever come across that, mm -hmm. Michael? I don't know about the association with anxiety. I just think tinnitus is really common. You know, people, sometimes they won't bring it up. But if you ask, um, you'll find a lot of people struggle with it and um it, I'm, myself i get a little bit of that um especially in the dark quiet of the you know like in the morning hours you know that for me personally that's when i kind of notice it and so i try not to focus on it because there's nothing i can do i've been told well it's just you know just something so i said okay i so i kind of live with it and i try to just focus on other things and um it doesn't seem to you know make me not be able to do what i want to do but it's it's bothersome at times, and so I get that. I completely get that. And it's like the, it's almost like the quieter it is, the louder it can get. Um, for me personally, it tends to be the morning hours. But I know everyone's, everyone's different. So um, yeah, make sure you're not doing too much self monitoring, because that can lead to why am I not sleeping? You know, and and then you're then that kind of just snowballs. So um, you know, take care of yourself, of course, but. I'm sure that you know you're not going overboard on the self monitoring. Hundred percent. And just to to finish up here, I just want to again point out that I, I hear this so much that uh, uh, a lot of people talk about tinnitus, and I think it is like you say, uh, Michael, that a lot of people have it. Like a lot of us have that, but then when you're hyper aroused and you're self monitoring, you pick up on it, and you often think, "Oh, there's something wrong. I have this new tinnitus." But again, oftentimes when we're looking out for things, we find them. So let's see here. Melina has some live things. 
Uh, Melina says, when I first got insomnia, I think it's because I got used to the sedating effect of gabapentin. It took all the responsibility I had to sleep on my own that when GABA stopped having the same effect, I started having insomnia. So every time I take medication, I'm a little skeptical to take it because I have been sleeping well on my own. What is your thoughts? Uh, what is your thoughts on this? Even when I am sick, I don't want to take oh, medication. Jeez, I think I understand this one. So the way I understand it is yeah. um, that Malena says that you know she started having trouble sleeping because she was taking gabapentin and it kind of like stopped working. And now she's afraid of even taking maybe Benadryl because the same thing will happen. Um, what do you think, Michael? What do you think she should think about? Yeah, well, Milena, you know, you you use the word sedating, you know, sedating effect. So you recognize that it's not really sleep; it's sedation, and that's different. Um, and you recognize that you're sleeping well on your own. So if if you're talking about taking medication for sleep, my first thought is it doesn't really sound like it's going to help at all because you seem like you're doing well. So you know, recognize the occasional poor night as just something that occasionally happens. Don't react to it strongly. And, um, I, you know, I don't know of a doctor out there who really would be, you know, you, you know, encouraging you to take something that's going to sedate you. Um, I, I don't think that's, that's really uh, what's going on. So I, I don't see the benefit of it. Um, I'm not going to obviously offer medical advice, but I think um, that you recognize that sedation, I think, is really important. Um, and, uh, you know, natural sleep, it's, it's not sedation. So, um, hopefully that offers some encouragement there. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I totally get it. Like, I, and I think Melina ha, yeah, got that part too. And I want to add, I, th I think that what Melina is, is worried about is that what if she needs to take something not for sleep, just for other reasons, and that happens to be, have the sedating effect. And then that somehow triggers insomnia again. I want to say that, um, I, you know, it comes to a point where, um, you know, protecting sleep actually, even if it is for like a, a, a very valid reason, almost can uh, be counterproductive. So let's say, you know, you, you're sleeping well by yourself, not taking medications. That's fantastic. That's great. You're starting to better. You're building your sleep confidence, but you have these kind of recesses in your mind, little things that you're a little bit worried about that you, st where you still kind of protect your sleep. And one of them may be, you have allergies, and you don't want to take Benadryl because you don't have trouble sleeping again. Well, in that mm -hmm. scenario, I think actually uh, it's, it's good. I think it is good to be brave. I think it is good to do things, uh, even if you're kind of scared that you will lose sleep, just know that I'm taking this Benadryl or whatever it is because I have some allergies now. And if I sleep little, if I somehow have insomnia after that, I'm not going to react to it. I know that it's because I'm kind of thinking about it. and. Um, when you do that, when there's no more recess in your, there's no more thing that you're doing to protect your sleep, then your sleep confidence becomes even stronger. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Don't be afraid to take something. You, you know, you're confident in your sleep. That's it. Just it overrides everything else. So um, I think you should be fine. Let's see. I think she kind of confirms it. She says, even when I have a cold, I'm like, e, I should skip on this, but instead I take it because my brain is trying for it to go away. You got it. Yeah, we, we understood it and I think we answered it. So that's perfect. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's, let's move on here to um, next question. And this is uh, from Thea who has um, sent a couple of questions before. And this is Thea, again, she has this funny handle, which is, I think I look mad when I'm dreaming. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So she says, hi, Daniel, it's Thea again. Things really get a bit better since last time. Well done. I have little trouble falling asleep most nights, exclamation mark, which is super encouraging. The problem is that I wake up very early in the morning. On good days, I usually sleep from a bit before midnight to something like 6 a.m., but on bad nights, I do wake up 4 a.m. and I can't go back to sleep. I feel like I conditioned myself into thinking that I won't sleep after I wake up and I don't think this will change until I prove myself wrong. Okay. Sometimes I do feel as if hours are passing by more quickly and I'm calmer. So I suppose I did sleep a bit, but it never feels like sleep. Other times I just lay completely awake and frustrated. So as I said, things got better. My anxiety went down, but now I have this problem and I don't know what to do. I know this is very common, but I feel so tired. 
it really feels like my body can only sleep better if it really is exhausted and I can't sleep when I want to. It's really frustrating. In the early morning, I feel like my anxiety spikes up because I know there will be light outside in a bit and I won't be able to fall asleep before that and I really can't sleep if there's light outside. I tell myself I only slept four hours and so I'm so tired but I can't fall asleep again and rest in the span of three hours. Maybe I should start waking up early every morning and get into a new rhythm. I really don't know how to stop this. My mind is up and about after little hours of rest and apart from my eyes burning, I feel completely awake. I really hope this will pass. Do you have some tips? Best wishes, Thea. Definitely have some things uh, that I think about, but uh, I'll, I'll let you go first again, Michael. What, what do you think? Yeah, Thea, so there's a lot in there. Um, you know, two things came to my mind right away. Uh, do you read that, Daniel? One, uh, you know, with Thea, you know, avoid the clock. Just get the clock out of the whole equation. Don't be, don't be monitoring the time at night. It doesn't help. And then the phrase, I think you use the phrase, lie there awake and frustrated or something like that. You never want to do that. You never want to lie there awake and frustrated. It's normal to be awake at night for a little bit. It's, 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 but you control what happens when that happens. You control it. You either stay there and lay awake frustrated. That's clearly not helping. Or you do something else. You got to do something. Just sit up. Do some reading. Do some coloring. Little, whatever tablet reading, whatever you want to do, you know, out of the sleeping position, you know, get, get the brain disassociating that alertness with your bed and sleep and all of that. Um, and then, I, and then at the end, I think you were talking about, you feel pretty good during the day. And so it, in my mind, that probably means that you, you're probably sleeping a little more than you think in those last couple hours. Um, it's really common to hear, and this might be a little bit of a side note, and Daniel, you probably recognize this as well, but a lot of people, you know, they'll talk about the first sign of, of light in the morning, they fall asleep. And it's almost like it's a cue. It's like a, it's a visual cue that they no longer have to try. It's like, well, I'm, who cares at this point? It's already morning. And they fall asleep. It's, it's, that, it's that attitude. It's that 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 change of how you're thinking about sleep that allows you to get out of your way get the brake off and the gas on and then you sleep but then obviously if you have to get up for something you're not going to sleep very long but i i think you're probably getting a little more sleep in the last part of the night um is my guess um but um you know i think try to work on the association stuff you know don't ever lie there in bed for long stretches of time awake you'll be frustrated alert tossing and turning all of that just makes the whole thing worse so i would go the behavioral stuff first i would say let's have, do you do something else other than lie there frustrated and awake and alert that's that's where i would turn and remove the clock remove the time checks i would say this thing uh, uh that Firstly, I'm super glad that you know you're doing better, and I think attribution is something I want to talk more and more about, which is basically this: that I think whenever someone is not sleeping well, it is good to attribute that to something obvious. I was stressed, I was anxious, it was this or that. Because when there's no mystery, you see like, okay, I didn't sleep because of this reason, and that's that. But when you're sleeping better, it's equally important to attribute that to the true reason, which is always, 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 always that you were trying less, you were, you know, you, you, and you were play, putting less effort into it. Right. And so I want to say, firstly, yeah. the reason that you have made progress is that you were actually more willing to have insomnia. You were, you were, you were trying less, you know, and, and so how can you do even better? The same, more of the same, you know, uh, you know, just like uh, Michael says, when you wake up in the morning, instead of being like, dang it, I, I, I woke up early. How can I get that last? How can I get those last two hours of sleep? Instead of going like, okay, I'm, I'm awake. It's clearly light outside. So I'm going uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to turn this wakefulness from a liability to an asset. I'm going to turn it from like, you know, uh, yeah. and negative to positive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this opportunity of what I have now that I'm awake to do something that is enjoyable or productive or something like that. And you'll see that when, when that happens, like magic really happens. You, when you no longer think of it as a negative that you wake up early, then your body comes, you know, your brain just comes more relaxed and, and it allows you to sleep in uh, for as long as it wants you to sleep, you know? Yeah, kind of completely, 100%. Right? 
And what else was I saying? Oh yeah, yeah. And I think I want to add this one too, which is I, I think I'm, I heard there in, there in that the I described feeling tired, and uh, and I think there's no doubt that you know if we don't sleep well, we feel tired. True, but a lot of other things can make us tired. One is the constant thinking about sleep, you know, obsessing about sleep, like all the all the all the thoughts directed in that way that makes you kind of mentally exhausted, just trying to figure out how you can sleep well. That makes you really tired, and. And also there are other things during the day that makes us tired, like uh, physical inactivity or things of that nature. So there may be th things you can do during the day that have nothing to do with sleep that can give you some energy, do things you enjoy, like sparks uh, excitement and things like that. And the less you think that sleep is the reason you, you're fatigued, the less pressure to sleep and, and the better you do. So those are my big ones right there. Okay, uh, Thea, uh, let us know how things go. Glad you're doing better. And let's go to our next one which actually our last one. And um, this is somebody who I think has done some CBTI and kind of maybe got stuck. Yeah, let's see. Let's read this. This is from Snehita. She writes the following. Hi, Daniel. Since you said you would answer in open class on Friday uh, because she had sent the short uh, question, and then she said, I thought if I give you details of my song, it would be helpful for others and me, uh, others who are listening to your podcast and facing similar issues like me. I'm a 27 year old young lady. I'm struggling with insomnia from 10 months. I started with four consecutive bad nights of sleep, which triggered my sleep anxiety. Then I started taking melatonin and going to bed even before I felt sleepy. Didn't work. Then I started taking trazodone 50 milligrams prescribed by my physician. And even that didn't work. And when I started taking 100 milligrams, worked for a few days, then stopped. I went to 150 milligrams, which initially worked for a week, then faded away, but my sleep anxiety kept on building. And then I decided to stop my medication and I started CBTI. Coming to CBTI, it was first hard. First four weeks, uh, then I started seeing improvement in week five. And I got a setback from then to now. And this is what's happening. There's no consistent results uh, with it. I used to have a lot of sleep anxiety. I've been practicing CBTI for three and a half months, not taking any medication, but I will take two glasses of tart cherry juice every night. I found your podcast and open classes really helpful. Now my sleep anxiety came down, but my sleeping pattern is very weird. I'm not getting any deep sleep. I'm having a lot of vivid dreams. By the time I feel like I'm going to sleep, it wakes me up. I don't know how to overcome this because I woke up the next. I wake up the next day not refreshed, and will I have? I will have this sense of nausea starting from noon or before. Do you have any suggestions how to uh, overcome this? Is this common in CBTI? So. Uh, I, I can go first here, as, as you have done that uh, so far, Michael, and just say, firstly, that um, the initial story is, uh, is is so, so, so common that you have, what, what was it, did she say what, what the trigger was? Um, she had four bad nights. Yeah, she, yeah we don't know exactly yeah, what, what happened yeah. there, exactly, but there was this stretch of four bad nights, which... I think a lot, it will, it will resonate with a lot of people when we call, I usually refer to this like as the big one, like that stretch where you hardly slept at all, you know, and, it, and what happens there is that, you know, you know, you have some type of stress, whether it's obvious or not what it is, and then you really start paying attention, like I didn't sleep at all last night, oh my God, what's happening, and then you, you're like, what am I going to happen tonight, and then you have another sleepless night, and then that really ramps up anxiety, and, um, and then even though it's only four nights, you know, it's a lot to not sleep for four nights, but those four nights can trigger so much thinking, so much entanglement, so many ideas, so much, so much worrying that you then can have trouble sleeping for a very long time. And as, as uh, Coach Michael and I are very aware, like what really feeds it in, in a big way is actually the, the attempt at trying to solve it, which is, for example, taking medications, you know, you, Taking medications can can give you some confidence. You think this is going to work, and then you feel good. But at some part of your mind is still like kind of a little skeptical. Like, is what's going on? Is this medication really help? Eventually, it stops working. Which to me is always when when it stops working. That is when somebody becomes really skeptical and no longer really believes it'll work. Then you go up on the dosage and you believe in it for a while. Then you stop believing it. It stops working. Mm -hmm. But in this process, you become you, you lose more and more confidence. You 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 externalize it into the medication, then the medication doesn't even work, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just giving a picture of like how this kind of escalation phase, or 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 at least the prolongation of the insomnia happens. So no surprises there at all. Now, now then, um, 
it sounds like Snead has stopped taking medication, which is not easy. So I think, but I think that's, you know, well done that you came off because that puts you in a position where if you're not on medications when you start CBTI, it, it, is, it is, is easier than if you're uh, taking something here and there, at least. If somebody's taking something very consistently or not taking anything at all, there's usually not too much uh, problems with that. So well done there. And now what I want to say here is that, uh, and I, I know we talked about this before, but it, it's very important. It serves to, to, to be said again. If somebody's doing CBTI for three and a half months and not really seeing that much progress, I think that there is some, there's something there that probably wasn't explained well or something to, of that nature. And what I think classically is the problem is that somebody's done this like traditional textbook CBTI when you're told like, oh, you can only spend five hours in bed, you have to stay up, you have to get up this morning, you, if, as soon as you, you wake up in the night, you have to get out of your bed. And what happens there is that CBTI actually can become a sleep effort. It can become something you do to try to sleep more. I gotta keep myself awake, I gotta stay awake. And then you never actually get to a place where you're, you have a relaxed approach to your sleep and there's less pressure and you sleep better. So yeah. I guess my, my big, big, big picture here is that nothing unusual at all. I think there's nothing unusual at all. And I think you'll do really, really well. Uh, and in fact, just a spoiler alert here, um, Snaita actually became uh, a client, uh, a bedtime client. So she started working with me like one or two days ago. But for anyone out there, I think just um, just learning that you ha you don't have to do it that way. You can have a much more gentle CBTI approach uh, that works really well. So my thoughts, Michael, what are, what are your thoughts here? Yeah. I would just say first recognize, you know, when, when someone starts, a, you know, the big one, the stretch of, of sleepless nights, it, it completely 100% logical why you'd be anxious about that. Because it's like a very mysterious thing that you just not really thought about. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's, it's, it makes you anxious to not sleep. I mean, you sleep deprive someone. If you just do that, you just make someone not sleep, noise, light, whatever they're going to get anxious pretty quickly. Um, sort of like if you can't breathe, you know, if you hold your breath as long as you can, and then, you know, towards the end, you're like really anxious, you'll do anything, you'll, you know. Um, so sleep is kind of along those lines, it's like a very homeostatic kind of thing. So first of all, just recognize it, it's really normal to get kind of anxious after a stretch of poor nights. Um, and then, you know, like Daniel said, just. I think maybe the hardcore CBTI, you know, just lock down that short sleep window and all that can sometimes have the opposite effect. It just can, it can trigger anxiety. Um, and, and that's completely understandable. So I like the idea take a different approach, you know, like, like there's this term sleep compression you may have read about. It's kind of like that. Um, but it's, it's basically a different mindset. It's a different way of looking at your sleep being much more accepting of what's happening to keep anxiety at bay, um, where you're spending time doing enjoyable things, you're not making any willful effort ever to sleep, you're not relying on anything you ingest, you're just trying to live in a way that sleep is like literally the last thing you focus on. And it can take a while to get there, you know, to, to get that mindset you know, to fully trust, you know, like your brain produces sleep. It does. Um, but it's got to be the right circumstances. It's kind of like you have to get out of your way um, for it to happen. And it can take a while. So I would not focus on any kind of time frame for, you know, for your CBTI or whatever you want to call it at this point. You know, don't have a goal like, oh, by Thursday, I'm going to be sleeping six hours. And then by Friday, you know, six and a half don't go down that road. It doesn't help. You know, you just, it's all very introspective. It's like, you know, if you, if you're, if it's during your, the night and you feel pretty sleepy and relaxed and calm, lay down. If not, find something else to do. Never, ever, ever will try to willfully initiate sleep. It'll take you in the opposite direction. 100%. And, and you know, uh, I um, have to add one thing, which is I, I where did I read this? I, I randomly read, about uh, these, uh, you know, like um, uh, cults, you know, when people get in, inside a cult and then sometimes you have like a deep programmer, like somebody who like helps this person see what's been going on and like helps them. So I, I was thinking like that, I should be, I should look at that like cult deprogramming literature and see <laughs> if I can pick up something that can be useful for insomnia because in many ways it's like you have these ideas that may not be true and etc. 
But I did. I, honestly, I didn't find that much that was helpful in the book I read. But one thing I, I was really, really interested in, which was this. Do you know how in these cults, you know, they kind of lure you in by for some reason, and then they, often they take you to this like uh, uh, a remote, uh, like a res resort or something like that, where you're with other cult members. And, and do you know how they kind of like treat you or how or what they do to you to to make you kind of get into the cult mentality? Sleep deprivation. Exactly, exactly. They make you super sleep deprived, sleep deprived, and then they have you kind of busy with all kinds of things, lectures, this and that. And it's and the reason is that when you're sleep deprived, your logic is off, yes. and your mind easily starts putting these things together that aren't true, and you, all kinds of beliefs and things can happen. And then when I read that, I was like, yeah, this is just like insomnia. You have this initial window where you're sleep super sleep deprived, and you're soup you're thinking about this all the time, and then you make all these connections, you become all entangled, you start all these beliefs. So. So uh, I, I just brought that up here to, to, to show that, yeah, that it's not hard to see how you quickly can get beliefs that are not helpful in that initial phase. Exactly right. All right, so yeah, so with that said, I wanna thank everyone for the questions uh, and Melina for the live questions and everyone else emailed and um, let's see here, everybody who has a question for us, send it to questions at thesleepschool.com. Yes. Great questions, everybody. Thanks for writing in. We have, uh, you know, um, a little behind the scenes here. Um, uh, our our video editor uh, was a little bit busy, but I think by the end of this month, you'll have uh, the videos ready for our basic course. Then we have like a kind of like medium course, if you will. And then we have a, actually a more advanced course, if you will. So, so, and all this will become a program, like a membership program. And I think we, we're gonna kind of reboot the sleep school and uh, the sleep coach yep. school very soon so i'm super yeah, excited I, I actually just did uh the, a video just earlier today finally got around to it um of my five favorite sleep tips so i think you're gonna find them kind of interesting it's maybe <laughs> not exactly what you th might think you know and, and uh uh so hope that hope you all enjoy that well now that you said it let's pick which one let's say which <laughs> one was number one which one did you pick well, first let's say let's see they, they all start with the word understand so as sort of like a i mean i guess technically like a command you know like understand not you know, reprimanding if you don't but just it's a suggestion like you know keep this in mind because i think and and it's so it's not like cbti like do your sleep window figure out this it's none of that it's like it's five things to understand because i think they just together really set the stage for behaviorally working on your sleep and um so that's um yeah um you can probably guess what they are daniel probably knows what they are but uh, <laughs> I, i'm um, not sure i have no clue but, can you give us one like if you well, pick one? let's see um well like okay like i've talked a lot about how it's normal to be awake at night so you know understand that like really think about it and kind of you know, whatever you need to do, just you got to believe that because it's true. There's like endless studies out there and, and uh, you know, there's you, you just it's not normal to not wake up at night. I mean, everybody wakes up, even if you don't realize it, you're waking up a, a handful of times at least. Um, and it tends to get a little bit longer awakenings as you get older because there's some pretty well documented changes in your circadian rhythm. But that's like, you know the elderly years. So um, just being awake at night, understand that it's pretty normal and it's all about how you react to being awake at night. That really okay. determines what happens to your okay. sleep and your insomnia status, you know, in the future. So that's just one of the five. Very, very good. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about the other four, et cetera, as we go along. So yeah, thanks for today, Michael and everyone else. And we'll be back next yeah. Friday. Take care, everybody.